Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to be back seeing you all in the flesh and to be able to preach to a foolish room rather than to a camera. I tell you what, it makes such a difference. Um, now, if you've got your Bibles there, and I would encourage you to, to open them and have them in front of you, it's very important that we have God's Word in our hands as we, as we share together. Uh, if you don't actually have it there, you can't tell for sure that what I'm sharing with you is coming from the scriptures and you can't see it for yourself and you therefore can't take it away with you in many ways. So if you've got your Bibles there, I want you to firstly to turn to Colossians chapter 2 uh, verses 8 through to 10 and uh, I'll give you a moment to get that in your Bibles and then I'll read that. And we've got two Bible readings today, so we're going to do Colossians chapter 2 and then we'll flip over to Romans chapter 8. So Colossians chapter 2 and we'll read from verse 8 to verse 10. Apostle Paul is writing and he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. And then over in your Bibles to Romans, or back in your Bibles to Romans, and we're going to look at a section today from Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. And once again, I'm reading from the NIV, and I trust that the majority of you are doing that as well. So Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. Once again, we have the Apostle Paul writing, this time a letter to the Christians in Rome. And this is what he says to these Roman Christians. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Uh, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now the talk today is the continuation of a small series that I began two weeks ago that was interrupted by the camp. Uh, but we began last, or two weeks ago rather, with this observation that within every human heart there is this relentless, incessant longing for a life that is somehow more full, more beautiful, more creative uh, than this one. Uh, we have times in our lives where life feels good and times when life feels really hard. But deep behind all of that is this ongoing, incessant longing within our hearts for a life that is beautiful and full. Uh, we enjoy, as I said before, we enjoy a fullness of life at times, but sometimes it just comes as glimpses, and those little glimpses give us a taste for something, for that reality to be really a part of everyday life. Uh, and this fullness... Um, uh, in Charles Taylor's words, and we quoted this to you last week, is that somewhere in some activity or condition lies a fullness, a richness, a place where life is fuller, richer, deeper, more worthwhile, more admirable, more what it should be. More what it should be. Now, in the passage that we just read in Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, uh, the Apostle Paul says to us that in Christ you have been bought to fullness, you've been brought to fullness. In other words, Paul is saying this fullness that we all crave is, and that we're all seeking is somehow found in Jesus. Now, by contrast, he warns them in verse 8 not to be taken captive by the hollow and deceptive philosophies that surround them. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at some of the major uh, proposals for fullness that our world makes and the one that we looked at two weeks ago was this proposal that fullness of life is found through the pursuit of personal greatness. Uh, but then we noticed as that talk unfolded that that proposal, as commendable as it is, uh, ends up uh, dividing us as people, it ends up enslaving us as human beings, and ultimately it ends up eluding us too. Uh, when we see that the purpose of life uh, this way then we end up with a world that divides us. Winning becomes everything. We end up as a, a world of gladiators that are competing with one another for the sake of personal greatness. Uh, when the pers purpose of life becomes greatness, we all become enslaved to the particular thing that we think will bring us that greatness, that will set us above everybody else. 
that will prevent us from being mediocre. And as we do that, we destroy other beautiful things in our lives, like our families, our relationships with others, all in pursuit of this greatness that we crave, but that ends up enslaving us. And then lastly and tragically, when we've done all that, when we've spent all that life pursuing that thing, we have arrived there and suddenly discover that it's as, as empty. It just hasn't delivered the thing that we hoped. Uh, the fullness that we thought would be there, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, seem, it turns out to be empty. Uh, it eludes us. I've actually wondered this week uh, if this is part of the tragedy that we're seeing unfolding for us in President Trump's refusal to accept the US election result. Uh, the last four years have revealed that he's a man that's clearly driven by the obsession for the spotlight and for winning at all costs. Um, but now he's about to lose the greatest stage that he has ever walked on. Uh, where can he find now a greater stage than the one that he's been on for four years? I mean, there really is none, is there? I mean, the American presidency is the ultimate stage uh, in our world to walk upon. And so his obsession with winning at all costs has ended up dividing his people. Um, it's so enslaved him that he's even prepared, it would appear, to destroy uh, American democracy if necessary. And lastly now, it's about to elude him. And I was just watching a uh, press conference with him last night and he looks very different at the moment. Um, those kinds of losses are huge for a man who's made his life all about winning and about personal greatness. However, if I also concluded, when I concluded our message last week, I stressed that the, actually the aspiration for personal growth is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, the hunger for a better version of ourselves is a, is a good thing, a worthwhile thing. Actually, it's the right instinct. Uh, it's God-honoring because um, it's something that God has always desired for us. Uh, and it's also, we'll find out, part of the fullness that God wants for us. Now, our dilemma, obviously, is how do we attain that without defaulting to a pursuit of greatness that ends up dividing us as human beings, enslaving us as people, and ultimately eluding us? That's the question. Now, the answer, I, feel, I believe, is found in understanding fullness in the way that the Bible describes it. And I want to explore that with you today uh, through this passage in Romans chapter 8. Um, Colossians tells us that this fullness is found in Jesus. Uh, it says, for in him all the fullness of the deity lives, and in, and in him we have been brought to fullness. That's the words of Colossians. But Colossians doesn't tell us in detail what that fullness looks like, and so for that we need to go to Romans 8, which is where I'm taking you today. Uh, so what is this fullness of life that Paul is presenting here in Romans? <laughs> Well, I'm going to unpack it for you in, over a couple of weeks. Uh, but I'm going to suggest to you uh, that fullness, according to Romans 8, means three things, really. It means acceptance, it means transformation, and it means flourishing. And they're just three words, but I've given you, I'm trying to trim it down so they're memorable. There's the three things that fullness uh, involves. It involves acceptance, transformation, and flourishing. Now today I want to talk about the first, that of acceptance, and I want to introduce it to you in this way. Uh, in 2010, uh, Betty Lifton wrote a very influential article on both the beauty and the complexity of the adoption process, uh, and she wrote an article that's proved to be fairly influential called Ghosts in the Adopted Family. That was the name of the article. Now, I know little about adoption, and reading her article completely humbled me with a new understanding of both the pain, as well as the beauty, and as well as the complexity that goes along with the adoption process. Also noticed very interestingly last night, the New South Wales government is now going to allow adopted people to have both their birth family as well as their adopted family on their birth certificates, and I think that's a a beautiful thing um, and as I unpack what Betty Lifton has to say you'll see why that is so, uh, so significant. Now in her article Lifton explores what she calls the ghosts, the ghosts that exist through the adoption process. 
Uh, she, said, she says, these ghosts represent the lost babies, the parents who lost them, and the parents who found them through the adoption process. But she says, these ghosts are dangerous because of the pain they represent. And so what we do is we consign them to a place that she calls the ghost kingdom, the ghost kingdom. And so for the adopted child, uh, at the point of adoption, their birth mother goes as a ghost into the ghost kingdom. She's the mother they've lost. And in the ghost kingdom, this mother lives eternally young in the mind of the child. Now, um, also that, 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 that kingdom ha has another ghost for the baby. It's the ghost of what they might have been if they'd stayed with their birth mother. But the birth mother also has her ghosts in the kingdom, kingdom as well. Uh, the first is the ghost of the baby that she gave up. And like her trauma, that baby remains frozen in time. Uh, in the ghost kingdom for the mother, that little child never grows through the terrible twos, uh, never goes into that scruffy adolescent phase. Uh, they remain perpetually uh, beautiful and cuddly in the crib. Therefore, for many birth mothers, it can be a shock years later when they actually meet the child again and discover the child's morphed into a very unfamiliar adult. But for, the, but for the birth mother, the ghost of the birth father lives in that kingdom too because there's unfinished business between her and the father. And finally, there is the, the ghost of the mother that she imagines she might have been had she raised the child herself. So she lives perpetually with the knowledge that she's conscious that she's a mother even though she and nobody else recognises it. Now, and finally, the, the adoptive parents have their own ghosts as well. Uh, sometimes for the adoptive parents, the ghost is the perfect baby they never had or could have. Uh, the child that would have reflected their DNA, that would have shared their talents, fulfilled their aspirations. And they may try to ignore the ghost of the birth mother of the child they are raising, but she has this way of materialising again, especially when the child screams, you are not my mother. So what Lipton is saying is that this, this, this ghost kingdom contains these ghosts um, that are part of the pain as well as the beauty of the adoption process. Now, I share this with you because I think it sums up in a way uh, the way we're all born into our world. We all come into the world adopted because you see, we were stolen at birth from our real father and now we live with the ghosts of the past. And so we're incessantly searching. We're searching for that elusive family that somehow sits in the background as ghosts for us that we know and sense is somehow there but we can't find. Now, for those of us that have been born into good families, much of that elusive search is, satis is satisfied by those families. Um, it's just in moments where... We sense that there could be and there should be more. But for those of us that have been born into broken or dysfunctional families, then the ache becomes much more acute. We, we look at loving families and we say, I wish I'd been born into that family. Or I wish he had been my dad. Or I wish she had been my mum. But what those miss is that even those that grow up in, in good families loving families, still experience some of this ache. You see, we're all searching for the ultimate home and the family that we lost back in the Garden of Eden. Now, the Bible tells us that the family and home we're searching for is God's family and it's God's home. And that, you see, is the first dimension of biblical fullness. Fullness is coming back home. Fullness is knowing the glorious, breathtaking wonder of coming back home to the full, unreserved acceptance of God and of his family. Now, uh, this acceptance is glorious, and uh, Romans uh, 8 tells us three things about it. Um, and these are the three points that are going to shape our talks over the next three weeks or thereabout. So if you're wanting to uh, note them, um, and particularly for today, um, these are the three things that we're going to be looking on, uh, looking at. So this acceptance is glorious, and Romans 8 tells us these three things about it. Firstly, it comes through adoption. 
Secondly, it's experienced as love. And thirdly, it concludes in an inheritance. So it comes through adoption, it's experienced as love, it concludes in inheritance. That is what acceptance in God's family means, how it's revealed to us. It comes through adoption, it experiences love, and it concludes in an inheritance. So these are my three main points for the rest of my message. And so if you're taking notes, then just know I'm going to follow those for you. So let's begin with the first dimension of acceptance, and that is that it comes through adoption. And if you're looking at your Bibles there in verses 14 to 15, you'll see that there. In, in Romans 8, chapter 15, Paul says, that the spirit you, re you received brought about your adoption to sonship. In verse 14, he tells us that those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And what he unpacks for us in verse 15 is that the Spirit who has led us into adoption doesn't lead us into slavery as was our former life, but rather he leads us into adoption as the sons and the daughters of the living God. That's the work of the Spirit. Uh, so our acceptance into God's family comes through adoption. Now, the concept of adoption uh, would have been well known in the Greek and Roman world of Paul's day. Um, and so when he used this analogy for his Roman readers, they would have known exactly what he meant. Uh, in the Roman world of the first century, adoption was commonplace, particularly amongst the wealthy who may not have been able to have their own children or may have lost their own children. Uh, and in this case, an adopted son could be deliberately chosen uh, by his adoptive father to perpetuate his name and inherit his estate. Uh, but even in the case of where the adoptive father had other children, the adopted son within the, within the Greco-Roman world was in no way less inferior to the other children or sons. In fact, sometimes the adopted son could enjoy the father's affection more fully and reflect the father's character uh, more adequately than did his natural sons or daughters. Now, Francis Lyle, uh, who wrote a book called Slaves, Citizens and Sons, exploring this idea uh, in the first century, uh, explains the effect of Roman adoption upon the adoptee, and he says it was profound. In Roman adoption, the adoptee was taken out of his previous state and placed in a new relationship of, a, of son to his new father. All his old debts were instantly cancelled, and in effect, the adoptee started a new life as part of his new family. That was the effect of Roman adoption. And this, Paul says, is what happens to us the moment we repent of our refusal to let God be God in our world and in our lives and we, when we turn back to him in love. At that point, the Holy Spirit takes us out of our slavery, uh, signs the adoption papers, and then ushers, in, ushers us into the family of God. Uh, and I'm just using my imagination here, but imagine that this is, process has occurred and the Spirit is ushering a new adopted ch uh, child into God's home. And as he comes in through the door, he shouts and says, come, everyone, gather around. Come meet your new brother. Come meet your new sister. Um, like you, they've been rescued from slavery. And like you, the Father has adopted them. So rejoice. Here's your new brother. Here's your new sister. Now, the question that this leaves us with is, what is this slavery that Paul uh, is talking about here? Um, well, there's no doubt that slavery too, just like adoption, um, would have been an idea that was immediately understandable to uh, Paul's Roman hearers. You see, they lived every day with slaves around them. Slavery permeated every aspect of, of life in the first century. And it's in fact, it's very likely that there were a number of slaves that would have been in the Roman churches and congregations that Paul was writing to and that would have heard this read to them. Uh, I just imagine their thoughts as a slave as they sat and they listened to these words from the Apostle Paul and imagine their thoughts, I know I'm a slave, but Paul's telling me that now I'm a son or I'm a daughter. Uh, in God's world, that's what I am. That's what I've become. I've been adopted into his family with all the privileges that comes from that. Now, that is remote for us. We don't understand the impact that that would have had on a slave in the first century, but 
When your life is completely controlled by another, imagine the beauty of the thought that one day you're going to be transferred into a family where you're going to have the rights of a son, the rights of a daughter. And I'm sure that for a slave in the first century, as they listened to Paul's words, they would have wiped away a tear at the thought. Now, while that is all true, uh, that's not the kind of slavery that Paul is talking about here. So what is it? What is the kind of slavery that he's talking about? Well, the first thing he says to us uh, is that this uh, former slavery or way of life, it ends in fear. This is what slavery looks like. It ends in fear. See, Paul says in verse 15, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. In fear again. And so this life of slavery that Paul is saying we've been taken from ends in fear. And the spirit uh, redeems us from that through adoption, um, we live now into a, a we, we move now through the spirit into an adoptive family where the opposite is true, the opposite of fear is true. But that still leaves us with the question of what was the former way of life um, that led to that embodied this slavery and that led them into fear? Well, I'm going to state what it is and then I'm going to unpack it for you because it's a little bit harder to find it in Romans than it is in Colossians, but we're working in Romans. I want to say to you that uh, the first thing we learn about this slavery is that it ends in fear. But the second thing I want to say about it is this slavery is life according to the flesh. That's life according to the flesh. Now, if you've got your Bibles there, you look back to verse 13 and you'll find that this former way of life is, in Paul's words, according to the flesh. He says, therefore, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, then you will live. So Paul is contrasting life according to the flesh, which ends in death, with life in the spirit, which ends in life. So that leaves us with a question still, what is the flesh? Well, some translations, and if you've got one of the older NIVs, uh, you'll notice that the NIV translates here, uh, not flesh, but sinful nature. And uh, what it's doing is referring to the, the part of us as human beings that has been corrupted by sin and the con constant de defaults to those old sinful desires and passions that uh, drove and the drive and controlled us. Now, the flesh is certainly that. Uh, but one commentator, Douglas Moo, has said that we must recognise that it's much wider than that. He says... Flesh sums up what we often call the world, all that is characteristic of the life that was lived in rebellion against God. So that's what Mu is saying it is. Uh, so Mu is saying that this slavery, in a sense, is the world. It's a world which is lived in rebellion to God. It's a world where false philosophies um, are constantly being created as pseudo means of fullness. These are hollow and deceptive philosophies, Colossians says. Um, they promise fullness, they promise meaning and significance, but they never ultimately deliver. They're hollow and they're deceptive. So you see, with Romans 8 now, we're back to our first sermon. Uh, and for those of you that have heard it, you'll remember we were talking there about our immortality projects. You know, that's Ernst Becker's idea, is that all of us are on these immortality projects that we pursue, hoping that they will fill the emptiness and give us the joy, meaning and satisfaction that we're all craving. And so we're driven by these empty and hollow philosophies. But what Paul is telling us here in Romans 8 is the Spirit has rescued us, he's redeemed us from that and from the need of those things. But we need to still think about, you know, these hollow and empty philosophies. They, they, still, they still result in fear. The fear is still there. Uh, and now this is the question, what is that fear? Well, from last week, oh, two weeks ago, rather, I keep on thinking last week. But go back if you need to, to listen to that sermon. In Becker's terms, uh, what he would say is that man's greatest fear, mankind's greatest fear is the fear of death. Uh, and the knowledge that ultimately everything we do will be swept away. And he said that fear drives us, absolutely drives us. But uh, from that sermon too, I was talking about the fear that Madonna has. She says it's the deep, deep fear of inadequacy. Uh, it's that horrible fear that no matter how much I do, I'll always be mediocre. I'll always turn out to be inadequate. And that drives her. That's the fear that she's so 
beautifully and frankly acknowledges. For many of us, the fear is, is um, the failure in C.S. Lewis, Lewis's terms of gaining access to the inner circle. Um, you know, all of us go through life wanting to be part of an inner circle. It starts in high school, doesn't it? Or well, it starts in primary school, but it becomes very amplified in high school. You know, as the classes and the groups break into their cliques, that's one of the worst things of coming into a new school. Um, you've got to somehow find that inner circle that you can break into. And if you're left outside of it, it's a very lonely place to be. And so we all have this fear of being left out of the inner circle. Um, we want to be in the inner circle in our workplaces because we want to be amongst the decision makers for that will make sure that our jobs are secure and that our value is recognised. Uh, we want to be in the, on the inner circle of a particular club or a group of people and our greatest fear is that they will despise or reject us. So this is a massive fear, you see. Uh, but the answer to that is in knowing that we're unconditionally accepted and welcomed into the ultimate family, into God's family. It's because he, the one who lives out beyond the Father's reaches of this galaxy, has said, I know you and I love you. I've redeemed you through my son. I've adopted you into my family and now nothing can separate you from my love. That's the, that's the family that cures all our needs of every other family, of every other inner circle. Uh, when we realise that, that's when we have nothing to fear. That's when we can say, um, I don't have to fear death. I don't have to fear my deepest inadequacies. I don't have to fear not belonging. I'm accepted into God's family, so nothing else matters. See, that's the answer to the fear that is driven or results from our slavery. I don't know how many of you uh, remember the 1992 Olympics and the 400 metre semi-final when the British sprinter Derek Redman um, crashed to the ground around about the 150 metre mark uh, with a torn hamstring. Um, he was visibly in pain. I mean, I've got the picture there for you. Uh, as he struggled to his feet, he desperately wanted to finish the race and he started hobbling to the finish line. And as he was hobbling to the line, the crowd just went into silence as they watched. But then moments later, it just erupted into a standing ovation as... Derek's father, Jim, ran from the stands, barged past the security guards and ran to his son and together supported him on his shoulder until they finished the race together. Now, Derek was disqualified because he hasn't run the race. He hadn't made the race by himself. But I want, I want you to see the power of this particular metaphor. And that's how I'm wanting to see, I want you to see it. You see, before his father arrived, he was just another has-been broken-down athlete fumbling his way to the line. All the others were there, already there. But the moment his father joined him, he became not a broken down athlete, he became Jim's son. And no one was going to despise Jim's son. That's why the father was there. No one's going to despise my son. And that's how it is with being adopted into God's family. The moment we're adopted into God's family, we're not a has-been, we're not a wannabe, we're not a weakling, what an inadequate cripple. No, we're God's son, we're God's daughter. And he will defend us. He will walk alongside us. He's the one that will dash from the stands, catch us in his arms and defy the whole world. Don't you despise this one. This is my son, this is my daughter. You attack them, you attack me. We're family, that's what God is saying, you see. And so when we're adopted into God's family, it just changes everything. It changes absolutely everything. And I, and I trust that I've been able to explore that a little bit with you. But let me just more, more quickly go on to uh, the second thing that, about um, acceptance in God's family. The second thing is that we experience it as love. It's experienced as love, this acceptance is. We read in verses 15 and 16, that not only does the Spirit bring about our adoption, uh, but the Spirit causes us to cry, Abba, Father, verse 15, and the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're also God's children, verse 16. Now, both of those things are fascinating comments and we need to examine them. Um, however, their net effect is to cause us to experience our adoption and acceptance with God as real and tangible love. That's really what's being expressed here. The Spirit somehow brings us to a place where we experience the love of the Father. 
Uh, both of these things are the work of the Spirit in our lives. Once we've surrendered to God and responded to his love, we, we, we cry out, Abba, Father, and we also somehow have testified to our spirit that we are a child of God. So let me just briefly explore those two things with you. Firstly, the, the first statement, that the Spirit causes us to cry, Abba, Father. Not long after Ebby um, was born, we had a discussion, or might even be before that, we had a discussion as to what Ebby was going to call Carolyn and I. Um, we knew that was going to be important, for once that decision was made, then every other grandchild that came after that would be locked into this descriptor. And so it was a really important decision to actually make. And after a certain amount of debate, I became Poppy and Carolyn became Nanny. Now, originally, I was going to be Gramps, um, but I kind of objected to Gramps because Cara, um, our oldest daughter, had an had a old car, a grey old car, that she had owned that she called Gramps. Um, and that car also had a problem with the front shocks. So every time you went over a speed bump, it went boink, boink, boink. It was very dangerous, actually, but uh, I, I shouldn't, as a father, I should never let her driven it. But, but she did, and fortunately, God protected her life. But so we had, she had this old car. It was grey. It was old. and went boing, boing, boing whenever it grew anywhere, and it was called Gramps. And so the idea of being grey, old, and going boing, boing, boing through life was not very appealing. So I insisted on Poppy rather than Gramps. Now... The only people that call me Poppy in the world are my two grandchildren, Evie and Bowden. So if you want to call me Poppy, then you're going to have to be a midget and you're going to have to be my grandchild. And I don't think, imagine, any of you are going to be able to max that. So I'm going to be Poppy at the moment, just the two people in the world. Now, the reason I mention that too is because in verse 15, we're told that the Spirit causes us to cry out to God, Abba, Father. Now, if you've been around Christian circles for any length of time, you'll probably have had explained to you that Abba um, translates an Aramaic word meaning Papa or Daddy. And now, while there's merit in that suggestion, uh, the true significance of the word Abba is that this was the name that was Jesus' unique name for his father. That's the, that's the name he used when he addressed the father. Now, the Jews would never have addressed God in that kind of familiar way, but and whenever they prayed to him as father, they always had something like our father in heaven in order to try and avoid the impression of presumption. But in the Gospels, Jesus constantly addresses God as father. And in Gethsemane, in his most desperate hour, he uses this doubled form of Abba, father. And you'll find that in Mark chapter 14, and verse 36. So the true significance of the Spirit encouraging us to use this name for the father here is that that was Jesus' special name for his father. So what the Spirit is communicating is that through adoption, we're now entitled to address God in exactly the same way as his only begotten son addressed him. And so the intimacy that existed between Jesus and the father, what the adoption process is saying to us, that's the same intimacy now that you share with the father. What was true for Jesus is now true for you as an adopted son or an adopted daughter in the family of God. Now, but much more than that, in verse 16, we're told that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, what's going on with that statement, the Spirit testifying with our spirit that we are God's children? Well, it appears that when we become a child of God, that the Spirit somehow communicates with our spirit that we are now a member of God's family. That's one of those things that's really hard to explain. Um, but when I became a Christian, I knew something had changed. Somehow I now knew that I knew God personally. can't explain to you why it was, but I knew something had changed in that direction. And that's why as Christians, when we try and, and, and communicate what we see as the most important thing about becoming a Christian, uh, we, we say something like this, well, it's coming to know God personally. Now, if you're not a Christian, then when you hear that comment, and, I'll, and I've made it in front of people that weren't Christians, and, and their response is to look at me quite quizzically, uh, they really don't get that. But when you say it to people that are genuinely Christian, they do get it. They do get it. They understand that. Uh, and so that's what's happening here. You see, the Spirit is testifying with our spirit that we're part of God's family. 
that God is our Father and we know him personally. It's a work that the Spirit does. And that's what Paul is telling us here. It's a work the Spirit does. So you see, acceptance with God is experienced at some point in all our lives as a love moment with him. Uh, now it's true that our feelings can sometimes deceive us and sometimes God seems so far away. And in those moments, sometimes months, even years, we need to keep reminding ourselves of the truth of the gospel, and that is that I'm a child of God. I've been adopted into his family. And so in those moments of darkness, you go back to those truths. You come back here to Romans 8 and you remind yourself, it's true, I'm a child of God. Because I've trusted Jesus, I'm a child of God. I know him as father. But it's also true that for all of us that are Christians, there should be a moment in our lives when we know that God loves me and that I'm loved as a child. Um, I think Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones pictures this so beautifully. He says, it's like, he said, imagine it like this. He says, it's like a father walking along the road um, with his little boy and they're holding hands. And the little, little boy, well, he knows that this man is his father and he knows that his father loves him. But suddenly the father stops picks up the little boy, lifts him up, in, lifts him to his arms, embraces him and then kisses him. Then he puts him down on the road and they just keep walking along again. Now, as a result of the father's action, the boy is no more a son after he was embraced than when he was, before he was embraced. Nothing's really changed. The father's action hasn't changed the relationship. It's not changed the status of the boy at all. But, oh, you see what Martin Lord Jones says, but look at the difference in the relationship before and after that, suddenly in that moment of love, that realisation became real and became deeper again. Uh, and that's the extra assurance sometimes that the Spirit gives us at those times where God is making certain for us that, that we know that he's our Father. And in response to that, we say, Abba, Father. We acknowledge that relationship. Just as Jesus knew his Father for certain, and just as you knew his love for certain, there are times when the Spirit wants to do that for us. Now, can I just hit the pause button for a moment? Um, I just want to say to you, have you ever had a moment like this personally? Have you ever had a moment when you just knew that you're a child of God? Now, you might have been coming to church for years. You might have been hanging around for Christians for decades. But unless you've had a love moment like this at some point in that experience, then you need to question whether you're actually a Christian or not. If you can't really say, I know God personally, and somehow I know that's true, then it may be a statement to you that the Spirit is testifying to you that you're not a child of God and that you need to go back and look at that again carefully. Um, and can I just ask you, um, if that has been your experience, then, then please come and speak to me at the end. We can... I can, I can pray for you and we can ask that the Spirit will help you to see and understand and the adoption and acceptance will become sure. So that's our second point. Uh, acceptance comes through adoption, it's experienced through love, and lastly, it concludes in an inheritance. It concludes in an inheritance. In verse 17, uh, you'll notice that Paul tells us here, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So what Paul is saying is that when we become a child of God, we also come into an inheritance. God promises that. One of the regrets that, one of the regrets that Carol and I have had, sometimes had in recent years uh, is that because most of our lives were spent in Christian ministry, we don't have much of a physical inheritance to pass on to our kids. Uh, now, I know they'll probably say to us that you've passed on a spiritual heritage um, inheritance and, and actually that's the real value. But sometimes both of us, and we've talked about this in recent years, we sometimes would love that we could just share upon our kids just more physical blessings. To be able to say to them, here is a home, um, take all the pressure off yourself, just go pour your life into into serving Jesus and loving others. You know, don't worry about that. We've got your back financially. You don't have to worry about a thing. Well, we would love to do that, but the reality is we can't. We just don't have the resources. But what I want to say to you is this is exactly what God does for us, or I should say that's what he's got in store for us. And that's the problem when Christians spend their lives accumulating wealth I mean, in the end, it's all going to disappear. But what God is saying is, I've got the whole thing built for you. It's waiting. There's a mansion there 
The inheritance is there just waiting for you. So don't get sidetracked to trying to build your own. I've got one, and it's an amazing one. It's going to blow our minds when we see it. Uh, so serve now because the inheritance is assured. Um, and, and let me say to you that there's a sense in which he can hardly wait to share that inheritance with us. I mean, first Peter tells us that, you know, when there's questions, why is God so slow in returning? And, and we're told there that he's not slow. It's just that he's waiting for people to come to know Jesus before he finally brings the, the world to a crunching close. But God longs to be able to bring us into that inheritance. That's his love. That's what he wants to do as the father. I mean, so we want to do it in a very small way. But, but our great father wants to do that and pour it out upon us abundantly. Um, I'm going to ask my wife's forgiveness for this the moment I say it. But as a family, sometimes we laugh at Carolyn because um, she will buy us a present uh, and then she she's just she comes home with a present and then she's just bursting to tell us what it is because she just wants to give it to us. And uh, we laugh at her sometimes. But let me tell you, my wife is so like God at that moment. Um, as I see her barely containing herself with wanting to share that generosity, I'm seeing God. I'm seeing it in my wife. Um, it's her birthday today. We've already celebrated that. Um, but let me tell you, she would probably have preferred that it was somebody else's birthday today because she truly loves to give more than receive. Um, and that's exactly how God is towards us. And, you know, when we wait, wait until we get there and we see what he's got in store for us, it's going to blow our minds. It really, really is. Because he's such a generous father. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, we had quoted for us Keith Green before. You know, Keith Green has a song for those... I mean, I'm sure I'm my age here. you got to go back to when I was 18, 20. He was, the, he was the cool thing in Christian music, guys. But he had a song that said, you know, God's been building this world, built this world in seven days. Um, but he's spending a whole eternity building the next one, so this one looks just like a garbage can compared to what's coming. Um, you know, I, I think he's using a little bit of poetic license but because this world is incredibly beautiful. Uh, but get the point. He's a generous, generous God who's just waiting, longing to be able to pour out his inheritance upon us as children. Um, so what is that inheritance? Well, that's a talk for maybe next week or the week after. I'm not sure how the order's going to go. So I want to come back and address this question of inheritance. Let me just conclude, um, and you've been so patient. Uh, so, so the first dimension of fullness that God gives us through Jesus is this full, unreserved acceptance into his family. And we're going to talk about this more in coming weeks, but we can't receive that fullness without the complete and utter sacrifice of ourselves to him as well. In God's family, he gives everything of himself to us. But then he requires everything of ourselves back to him. Um, and that you know, re is reflected there in verse 17, as Paul tells us in verse 17. Um, this inheritance is is sure, but it comes after suffering. He says, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings. And that's where most of us stumble. We want the inheritance, but we don't want the suffering. But what we're being told here is that's impossible. You see, because the hands that will reach out and hug us when we get to heaven, uh, the hands that will reach out to bless you, to give you the inheritance, will be hands that will have deep, deep scars in the middle of them. Uh, they are beautiful hands that were broken, beautiful hands that were disfigured in order that you and I could be adopted into God's family. They came at enormous cost to him. And he calls us to live the same, to give up our life in this world in light of the beautiful inheritance that is coming. So suffering is a part of it, and we'll discuss more of that as we go. But let me just finish uh, in this way. Do you see what happens when our greatness is something that we receive rather than achieve? You see, our modern world teaches us that greatness is something that we achieve. And I was about to throw in a whole section here on existentialism, but I decided to leave that. Um, but essentially what's happened is our modern world has persuaded us that greatness is something that we have to achieve. Uh, but when we recognise that greatness in God's family is something we receive, not achieve, look at what it does. Well, firstly, it doesn't divide us because none of us have to compete for it. 
It's all ours by virtue of our birthright. Secondly, this greatness doesn't enslave us because none of us have to work at it in order to establish our value. I'm a child of God. That There is my value. So I can work with my, all my heart and my life to bless others, but then I can let it go when the time is right because my value is not found in what I've achieved but in what I have received. And lastly, you see, this greatness never eludes us because it's conferred by an infinite dad. And as long as he exists, I will exist. As, as, and he exists, and part of his joy in eternity will be us as his children. As he watches us grow and flourish, we're going to do a lot of growing in heaven. And as he swings us up into his arms, he says, you know, you're just like my Jesus. And that's where we're headed, folks. We're going to be just like his Jesus. And then he puts us down on the ground and says, come on, let's go party. Because that's the inheritance. All right? That's where we're headed. That's what fullness looks like. Well, the first part of it anyway. Shall we pray together? Oh, our Father, that, that word is just so full of meaning for us when we really understand it. What a, what a privilege to be a child of God. What a privilege to have been brought to a place where we've seen the beauty of Jesus and we've been able to respond to that in love. Oh, Father, we just, just pause this afternoon just to thank you again for the wonder of what it, needs, what it means to know you as our ever Father. Thank you, thank you, Father, for your son. Thank you for the, the labour he expended in order that we could experience that life. And so we just want to thank you, Father, as we finish, just for the wonder of what you've done and the glory of who you are. And so we give you our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you.